And one of the things that, uh, and we do, we've got a number of activities connected with it. We have this intercultural dialogue, or, uh, an interreligious dialogue, and we have, based in, again to digress for a moment, one of our little known but very valuable institutions is called the, it's the North South Centre. It's based in Lisbon. It arose 25 years ago after all those international reports and international concern. The most classic example being a report by Gro Brundtland. Uh, about the north-south divide in the world and the north-south center was the council of Europe's response to that and their job is to raise awareness in the north hemisphere particularly in Europe uh, of the problems of the southern hemisphere uh, originally of course it was poverty but now it does tend to be uh, intolerance discrimination the need for mutual respect and so we're doing a lot of work on there and we, we've published what is called a white paper I think I mentioned it to you when I said uh, uh, white paper on intercultural dialogue uh, which we are putting into effect which has some specific activities but I come back to the point I made about the mindset or psychology if you like because what we are trying to do at the Council of Europe is to develop much more than we used to our campaigning role in the past the culture of the Council of Europe was very legalistic it was oriented to the law the European Convention on Human Rights being the basis I suppose but it's my colleagues tend to think, when we talk about a problem, they tend to think of a solution based on law. And I keep trying to persuade them, and I come from a political background, I've forgotten all the law I ever learned, I suppose. Uh, I, I keep trying to persuade them that what matters is campaigning in a political sense. A campaign is not a seminar and a colloquy and a conference where the converted talk to the converted. Uh, without wanting to offend anybody, I, I actually often use the analogy and say Christianity would not have spread if, it's, if the disciples only talk to each other. Uh, there needs to be an evangelist role. And we need to be going out to advocate in practical terms the values which we say we represent. One, we had, for example, uh, a campaign which was very effective, was a campaign against violence against women. Very effective. We're now going on to build on that. In fact, we are now going to legal remedies because we're drafting a convention about violence against women. I was saying earlier to you and your colleagues that uh, I uh, think we perhaps could learn because you've had a convention about violence against women for 15 years. And I'm going to encourage my colleagues in the Council of Europe to learn from your experience. But the campaign about which I'm most enthusiastic and the one on which I'm giving most attention at the moment out of a range which includes, for example, a campaign under the slogan DOSTA. DOSTA is the word in the Romani language for stop it. And it's about discrimination against Roma people, which is a, a big problem in Europe. But the newer campaign, where I'm very much personally involved, is a campaign against discrimination on ethnic origin. And uh, the, the slogan under which we're doing it is speak out against discrimination. We've got some quite powerful posters, but we're working with the media on that. We're putting up posters in cities like Rome, Madrid, Milan, Paris, London, uh, and I'm encouraging my colleagues to develop other cities as well. Why just go to the capitals, I say? Uh, but, and we will. Uh, but we are working particularly with the media because we've decided that given the scarce resources we've got, financial resources, which is one of our biggest problems at the Council of Europe, lack of financial resources, we need to find, be creative in the ways in which we campaign. So we are now working very closely with the media, the printed press, uh, television and radio, uh, and electronic media, in order to get across the message that people should not just pass by, walk down the other side of the street, as I said earlier, not be silent, but should speak out when they hear or see discrimination in order to make it clear this is not acceptable, this is uncivilized, this is not what we, the people of this town or this city or this country, this is not what we believe in. Uh, we have to persuade people to do that for us. I'm constantly affronted by the fact that the area where we're located in Europe actually has a very high incidence of racism. We measure that, I can measure that very subjectively by the number of times I read in the media about the desecration of Jewish cemeteries. But there's also a huge problem in Europe now with Islamophobia, which may or may not be a problem in the Americas, but is a huge problem in, in Europe because of imi recent immigration, uh, meaning that we now have significant Islamic minorities, or I should say minorities of Muslims, 
in many, many of our European countries. So what we're doing in practical terms is try as best we can, with the very limited resources we can, to the extent that we can, to make a contribution to changing people's attitudes, what do we call it, the culture, psychology, mindset, these sort of words. Uh, and I'm in the market for new ideas of how we can do that, new inexpensive ideas of how we can do that. Thank you very much. Hay una pregunta ahí de la audiencia, por favor, if you can introduce yourself as well, and then I have the Mexican representative here and another audience question here. My name is Mary Mullen, and I'm just a visitor here. I'm American. Um, I wanted to know about the structure of uh, the Council of Europe. In each country, are the representatives elected or appointed? And within the Council of Europe, how is the Secretary General um, selected? Is he appointed? Or, and how, well, how long is, uh, would the Secretary General be um, in power? Wow. Um, okay. Um, it was established in 1949, as somebody said in the introduction, and it is an intergovernmental organization, like the OAS. It's an intergovernmental organization. Uh, we now have 47 member countries. It started very much as an organization in Western Europe. Uh, and it, it uh, had about 10 to 15 member countries until the late 60s, and then it gradually increased in size to about 25, and then we had an explosion of membership in the 1990s. Following the breakup of the Soviet Union, and coupled with uh, re-established independence for countries like Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, with the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, having produced independent sovereign countries, all this has contributed to us having a huge increase in our membership. So now we are not simply Western Europe and Northern Europe. Uh, we do include Turkey, by the way, and Turkey has been a member of the Council of Europe for a very long time, almost from the beginning. Probably we, we, we're 60 years old this year. I think Turkey has been a member for 59 or 59 and a half years. Almost from the beginning. Not a founding member, but almost from the beginning. And uh, so for us, Turkey is part of Europe. Our boundary, our eastern boundary, so we stretch from Portugal, we stretch from Lisbon to Vladivostok in Russia. Uh, our boundary is the Caucasus Mountains, I suppose we would say. So there are four independent countries, the stat, four or five called Stans, uh, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, these countries, Uzbekistan, parts that were in the Soviet Union, which we regard as being Central Asia and therefore not eligible for membership at the moment. At the moment. I mean, that could change. Some people would like to change it, but uh, I'm an agnostic about that. It's not going to happen. And certainly during my time as Secretary General, for a reason I'll explain in a moment. So it's an intergovernmental organization with the governments of all those countries. That's one very, and they meet, ambassadors meet every week, uh, and that's the governing body of the Council of Europe. Next I need to explain, we have the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Every, by definition, a country must be a democracy, and its Parliament sends a delegation to an assembly, which meets four times a year, quarterly, meeting, and they have committees which deal with a whole range of issues, political affairs, social affairs, uh, human rights and legal affairs, economic affairs indeed still, uh, a wide range, migration, wide range of subjects, culture and education, committees of the parliamentary assembly, the committees meet very frequently. Uh, these delegations depend in size on the population of the country. So the countries with a bigger population all have the same level. They have 36 delegates, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, 36 delegates. Although they're half of them full members and half are substitutes, so it's 18 votes. And the delegation must reflect the composition of the parliament. So the government, will, governing party or coalition will have a majority, but the opposition must have their share and the smaller parties must be involved as well to the extent that they uh, using various complicated formula, can add up to a number. And so 36 shared fairly, and the credentials must be approved by the Assembly itself, and they will not approve the credentials if it's not fair. They also uh, ask for a proportion of women now to be members as well. So, although that's not a, I don't think that's a rule, it's just a request. Uh, and that body meets, uh, as I said, every quarter. In Strasbourg. The committees meet in Paris or in Strasbourg. 
Then there's another body called the Court of Human Rights, uh, which enforces, which deals with complaints from anybody in Europe. And you, I think you said you're an American, when you're in Europe, you are protected by the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, I sometimes, when I'm teasing my American friends, say, your human rights are better protected in Europe than they are in the United States of America, <laughs> because we have some rights you don't have. So, uh, anybody in Europe can take, can make a complaint to the Court of Human Rights on the grounds that the authorities have failed to protect their human rights, not just there's a duty to ensure that somebody's human rights are not infringed. Not enough to say the government's not responsible, they are responsible for making sure that your rights are not abused while you're in Europe. 